So today we will discuss uh, so-called one sample t-test. Uh, it is uh, a bit simplified version of uh, the two sample t-test uh, that is actually used uh, uh, in practice uh, usually. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes you can construct uh, a case when you have to use this one sample t-test, uh, for example, when you discuss uh, period samples and we will discuss it uh, as well. But uh, now I just want to introduce uh, uh, this family of tests, which are called t-tests or students' t-tests. So, students' t-test. Uh, and uh, to begin with, uh, let us discuss uh, the following problem. It is similar to the problem that we started uh, discussing on the previous lecture, uh, but uh, a bit simpler. Uh, and uh, in this problem, we have uh, one sample of data. For example, we, uh, we are interested in uh, height of uh, people in, for example, Moscow. And we have uh, only one sample. We selected randomly people in Moscow. Uh, so we have, uh, we selected Uh, randomly some people in Moscow. Uh, and measure it, for example, their, uh, their height. And obtained, uh, obtained some numbers. Uh, for example, 170, uh, 182, uh, 120, 190, and 185. For example, uh, we selected five five uh, citizens of Moscow and uh, obtained these numbers as uh, their height. And um, uh, let me find uh, the sample average for these numbers. And uh, assume that uh, we want to answer the following qu question. Assume that we know uh, from some data, from some census data, uh, for example, that average uh, height of people in the United States Uh, is uh, 167, for example. And uh, now I ask uh, the following question. Uh, can we conclude uh, from this data uh, that uh, people in Moscow uh, are taller on the average uh, than people in the United States. So uh, how would you answer this question? We have this data. And uh, you have a kind of reference value, this number 167. And uh, you want to answer, uh, is it true that uh, these data uh, allow, uh, allow us to conclude that uh, people in Moscow um, are taller than people in the United States? So what is your first step here?
-hmm. Yeah. Uh, first of all, we can uh, calculate mean of these numbers, sample average, sample mean. And uh, our sample mean, uh, as uh, Alexander calculated, uh, is so uh, is sample mean is uh, one hundred sixty nine dot four. Uh, so uh, we clearly see that uh, this sample mean is larger than uh, this reference number one hundred. Uh, 67. Yeah. Uh, does it allow us to conclude that uh, the answer to this question is yes? Can we give positive answer on this question? How do you think? How do you feel? I don't ask for mathematics now, just, just your, your intuition, your guesses. Can we make this conclusion or not? Uh, Sebastian thinks that uh, we need a bigger sample to compare. So the sample is not uh, large enough. Uh, actually, the size of uh, United States and Moscow and the number of people in Moscow and the United States is uh, not very important for us. So uh, we, uh, what, what, we, what we really want from, this, uh, from the United States data is that uh, we actually believe in this number. So we believe that this number is correct value for people in the USA. We believe that United States government just completed the full census of uh, uh, people if in the United States and calculated this number. This is exact value. But for Moscow, we don't have uh, such number. And uh, the only thing that we have uh, is uh, this, uh, this sample. So we want to use this sample to answer this question. Uh, so uh, are there any other ideas um, can we conclude, uh, can, we, can we make, we should not consider extreme values. What do you mean under extreme values? Mm -hmm. I think so. that the probability of error is quite high now. I mean that uh, the difference between uh, 169.4 and uh, 167 is not that big. Mm. So uh, first of all, we have to we have to see the difference between these two numbers, and you think um, is it large enough to to make us. Uh, to, to, to convince us that uh, we, we actually see the difference. So actually, what's the problem? Uh, why we cannot conclude just by looking at this number that uh, the answer for this question is yes? Because we don't know the probability of error. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we have, uh, actually, we, we, we understand that these, that these values are a kind of random values because if we try to reproduce the same experiment, we probably recruit different people and we will obtain different numbers. And so uh, due to the fact that we have this randomness, uh, we, mm, we must conclude that it is possible theoretically that uh, the difference between this number and this number is explained uh, just by just by this randomness. Of course, even in case uh, if the actual uh, the actual average height of people in Moscow is exactly equal to this value, when we make uh, this sampling, we will get different numbers as our sample averages. So sample averages uh, do not equal to the corresponding population average just because this is just a sample and it is a kind of random thing. And uh, so we, 
one one alternative is to explain this difference uh, just by this uh, just by this um, randomness in our in our sampling procedure. It is possible that just by chance, uh, in our sample, uh, we have a little bit more uh, tall people than uh, we have actually in our population. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. So uh, we have uh, we have two possible explanations. So uh, sample mean is larger than reference value. And then the reference value. Under under reference level, uh, uh, under reference value, I mean this number one hundred sixty-seven, with which we compare. And we have two possible explanations. Either it is uh, it is a result of randomness. Uh, or uh, uh, indeed uh, people in Moscow uh, are taller than on average uh, then 167, then our reference value. So uh, we have two possible explanation uh, of the data that we have. And now we have to select between these two explanations. Either it is result of chance, result of some randomness. Uh, and in this case, uh, we don't have to make any conclusions. Or uh, in fact, we see uh, the difference that is large enough uh, to be explained uh, as a result of randomness. And uh, what we will do uh, today is to understand how large is large enough. Uh, let, me, uh, let me consider different samples and uh, let us again uh, test our intuition. Uh, let us uh, consider different possible samples. So assume that we uh, obtained, um, uh, for example, this data. Ilya, uh, may I ask a question? So sure. uh, I remember that on the previous lectures we've talked uh, about this number, like 5%, and mm -hmm. uh, we've talked that uh, it matters, and if it, uh, and if it is uh, larger than 5%, then A, and if it is smaller, uh, then B. So um, are we going we, to... We will, we will return... Uh -huh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, we will return, we will return to this 5% uh, threshold. Uh, just uh, in um, just uh, just a little bit later. Uh, now uh, I'm just testing your intuition, and uh, I just want to understand uh, which factors will affect uh, our our decision. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we will construct uh, the precise uh, precise probabilistic model for our experiment. And after that, we will return to this uh, stuff about p-values, significance level, and so on. And you will see that uh, those intuitive, uh, intuitive ideas that we uh, will discuss just right now uh, will clearly be implemented uh, in this statistical test. So just 
just uh, just um, several minutes, and we will return to to this to this stuff. Uh, so uh, let us assume that uh, my uh, sample now is not the sample that uh, I wrote previously, um, but uh, another one. And this uh, and in this another sample, I have. I have these five values. Uh, so they all begin with 169, and uh, then we have dot five, dot four, dot three, dot two, and dot six. Uh, how do you feel? Again, uh, I um, ask the same question. Uh, assume now that we have this data. And I ask the same question. Can we conclude, uh, according to this data, uh, that people in Moscow are taller on average than people in USA? Again, we can find a sample average. What is the value of sample average here? If I, uh, if I made everything correct, then uh, the sample average is the same as previously. You can check it. Yeah. But uh, let us look at uh, these two samples. Uh, this sample that we had previously and uh, this new sample. Uh, in both cases, uh, we have the same sample average, this one. One uh, one hundred thirty nine uh, dot four, and in both cases uh, it is larger than the reference number. And uh, both uh, both samples, both uh, sets of data, uh, can be considered as an argument uh, to answer this question positively. To say that yes. Uh, our data suggests uh, that people in Moscow are taller than people in USA. But uh, let us look at these two data. Which one is more convincing? Which one uh, is more convincing in, in answering to this question positively? I guess the second one is more convincing because we could hypothesize that in Moscow, well, all the people which we pick up randomly have more or less the same height, mm -hmm. uh, which is not the case for the first uh, data set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, look, uh, you see that the difference between these two samples, uh, our initial sample and our new sample, is not uh, in uh, sample average. Sample average is the same. Uh, but we see that uh, we see that um, there uh, there is difference uh, in its in its variance. Numbers here are much more likely to each other. Yeah, uh, second set has less deviation from the mean. And so when we collected, uh, when we see that we collected this data, uh, we have to conclude that the sample average here probably is better estimate for our population mean, for the actual mean of uh, height of people in Moscow, than uh, this data, just because because the variance uh, is smaller, and uh, so so we have better better estimate. Um, Alexander writes that uh, it is a very small chance to get randomly all these heights. Yeah, uh, we have if we really believe in these numbers. We just have to conclude that uh, people in Moscow are just very similar to each other. Uh, of course, it is not very realistic uh, in this uh, in this case. But this is uh, this is actually what we have to we have to think. Uh, we have to think that uh, somehow uh, people in Moscow are very similar to each other, um, and this is what we have in our data. Um, So uh, we see that uh, if we have smaller deviance, uh, smaller variance in our data, uh, even uh, the same difference between our sample average 
and reference value uh, is more convincing, right? So uh, we, we have this factor, uh, the smaller variance Uh, the better, the more convincing are our data. So we have to take into account this variance and we'll do it. Uh, let me consider another example. Uh, for example, we have the following data. Okay, let me copy uh, this, uh, this data just uh, to avoid scrolling up and down every time. So this is our initial data. And uh, we have new data. And uh, this new data is like the following. And again, I ask the same question. Uh, what, uh, which data is more convincing? Uh, which data um, can be used as a more strong argument in favor of positive uh, answer to our question? Uh, this data or this data? The old one or the new one? It doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't matter? Mm -hmm. uh, the variance here is the same as the variance here. Uh, just because um, as uh, Alexander noted, uh, all values here are just obtained from values uh, here by adding 10. Uh, so the variance uh, is the same. Uh, but we have the same, uh, but the reference value is, uh, is uh, the same as previously. So uh, we have the same question. Uh, the question is the same. Uh, is it true uh, that people in Moscow, on average, are taller that are taller than one hundred sixty seven? So uh, actually, both uh, data, if you if you find uh, if you find sample uh, sample average here, you will get this value. Uh, what is uh, what is sample average for my new data? In fact, uh, if all uh, values are increased by 10, uh, what happens with sample average? It also increases by 10. Yeah, it is also- And uh, the uh, previous is, uh, uh, isn't it uh, 169.4? So you wrote, um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah correct, uh, correct, correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it have to be the same here, but increased by ten. So you can uh, you can check that sample average here is uh, this number. I hope uh, now I wrote it correctly, and sample average of, of this sample is uh, this number. And again, I'm asking uh, the, the same question. Uh, both samples 
suggest that people in Moscow are taller than uh, 167 centimeters. Uh, which data is more convincing? Which data uh, provides more strong uh, argument, stronger argument uh, to conclude that this, this is in fact true? This data or this data? Maybe uh, the second, but uh, the question uh, about randomness that we had previously is just uh, here as uh, in the previous case. So, uh, yeah, it, it seems like uh, it's uh, even more uh, convincing, like by mm -hmm. 10 points, but we have also the question of randomness. Yes, uh, yes, but um, let us look at this, at this value, 167. Let us imagine for a second uh, that our data actually obtained uh, from some population uh, with uh, this average. So let us believe for a second that uh, the answer uh, for this question is no. And uh, then uh, we are interested in which is more likely to obtain data like this or to obtain data like this. Of course, uh, as we see that uh, sample average here is larger, so the difference is larger, uh, it is less, uh, less likely to obtain this data from uh, the population with this uh, population mean. Uh, so uh, again, uh, we can see that new data is more convincing than uh, the old data. Everybody agree? Just because we have large difference and the larger difference we have, the more convincing data. Again, um, there is no 100% guarantees, but at least it are more convincing. Right, any objections here? Everybody follows? Just let me know if anything is not clear. I don't really understand uh, how we conclude then that uh, the larger uh, difference, the more convincing this data. Mm. Mm. Uh, okay, uh, we uh, we think that. Um, the logic is like uh, the logic is like this. Uh, we we calculate this sample average, and uh, we understand that this sample average should be more or less close to the actual population average. So, if I take uh, if I take uh, five random people from Moscow, um, for example, uh, assume that uh, I take five random people uh, in, uh, in Moscow. Uh, how do you think, is it possible for the average height uh, to be larger than 300 meters? No. Uh, it is not possible. Uh, but I I is it possible that uh, their average height uh, is uh, 100, uh, 190, 190 meters? Uh, 190. So, it is uh, possible. Uh, we see that uh, three uh, three hundred is not possible. And uh, one hundred ninety is possible. Uh, so if I ask, um, for example, well, uh, assume that uh, assume that, So, uh, as we believe that uh, this uh, sample average is not too far from the actual population uh, average, uh, we conclude that uh, the, the larger value we have here, the larger estimate for population uh, average we have, 
and uh, so uh, it is more the uh, the larger sorry so uh, the larger value here uh, the more evidence we have uh, in support that the actual population average is also is also large because it should be close to this value. Uh, does it make more sense now? Yes, now I understand that this data um, is telling us about about average in population. Yes, uh, yes, it is. Uh, yes, exactly. We uh, we understand that this estimate is not exact. We understand that the population average is not exactly equal to this one. But uh, as we uh, as we believe that these numbers are obtained as a random sample, and thus uh, we we may conclude that population uh, that, that sample average should not be too far from from the sample average. This is just like in the example with 300 meter uh, people in Moscow. We know that there are uh, no people of uh, this kind of uh, height uh, in Moscow or everybody el or uh, everywhere else. And so we conclude that uh, it is not possible for us to uh, get a sample with so large average. And this is this is a similar similar reasoning. So, other questions so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, then we will continue. And uh, so uh, now we can state, mm -hmm. yes, uh, yes, Alexander, and we will do it just in a second. Uh, and now uh, let us consider the third uh, the third parameter that we have to take into account. Uh, let us assume that we have uh, two samples, uh, two samples uh, with the same sample average. like uh, 169.4 and the same variance. So uh, two factors that we discussed so far are fixed, uh, but uh, the second sample Uh, contains 1,000 elements. And the first one, only five. So we have two samples of different sizes. We have two experiments. In one experiment, uh, we um, selected five random, random people in Moscow and obtained uh, and obtained a sample with this average uh, and some variance. And in another study, uh, we uh, recruited uh, 1,000 people. And again, uh, we have the same sample average and uh, the same sample variance. Uh, which of these two samples is more convincing if I want to answer positively to this question? second uh, the second one th that contains more elements that is larger so the larger the larger sample uh, the more convincing uh, the um, conclusions that you obtain using this sample great so uh, uh, finally uh, we have the following. Uh, we have the following factors: uh, the large difference uh, 
uh, the more convincing data we have. Uh, second, the smaller variance and the more convincing data. And a third, uh, the large sample and the more convincing data. So we have these three factors, uh, the actual difference, variance, and sample size. And now uh, we will take into account all these three, uh, all these three factors to make our conclusion in a statistically rigorous way. Note that we uh, come uh, with these conclusions without any mathematics. This is just our area. Uh, every everyday intuition. And now let us uh, introduce th some mathematics. So, are there any objections so far? Questions? I think I have a question. Yes. Uh, so um, you're saying that the larger the sample, the more convincing the data, but uh, there must be some point and at which we can just stop collecting the data, right? Yes, yes. So and we can discuss it... how much data we need. Yes, okay. yes, yes, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, this is just this is just a tendency. So uh, I just say that um, if you don't have, um, so the, this is this is just to say that if you collect larger sample, then you will get more convincing data. But maybe uh, maybe uh, some sometimes you have to stop. Yeah, we will we will discuss uh, everything now. So let us return to some mathematics. And let us return to our uh, box example that we discussed previously. Uh, so we have our population, which is modeled by uh, a box uh, with numbers. So every ball in this box uh, represents uh, one citizen of Moscow. And uh, we have some population mean here, uh, which we don't know. Uh, let us uh, let us denote this population mean by letter mu. And uh, we have a sample from this uh, from this population. So we obtained several values by picking random balls with replacement from this. Uh, from this box, and uh, this is this is our sample. This is our sample. Uh, let me denote uh, these numbers by x1, x2, and so on, xn. So x is is my sample, and uh, we have x bar, uh, which is sample average, sample mean. Now uh, let us return to my population. Uh, I want to answer the question about this mu. I don't know it. Uh, we don't know uh, this value. But we want to uh, we want to make some conclusion about this value by looking at uh, this sample mean. Uh, so basically, we have to choose uh, between two uh, possibilities. 
Uh, first possibility is our null hypothesis. And uh, our null hypothesis is the following. Uh, we believe that, um, let me return to, let me return to my question. So, uh, we are interested in this question, and uh, we have some data uh, that uh, looks like uh, that uh, this data is in favor of positive answer to this question. But uh, something stops us from concluding that uh, this is actually a positive answer. Uh, the thing that stops us is uh, the possibility of this explanation that that uh, the actual difference that we observe uh, is just the result of randomness. What does it mean? It means that we answer negatively to this question. We say that no, it is not true that people in uh, Moscow are taller on average than people in USA. And explain, try to explain this difference just by just by random fluctuations. Uh, mathematically speaking, it means that we believe uh, that our population sample, in fact, equal to uh, that our population mean, in fact, equal to this value, this reference value. So our null hypothesis is that mu, uh, which is population mean, equals to 167. And we have an alternative. Alternative is that, uh, no, it is not true. Uh, alternative is that mu is larger than 167. So what we actually uh, want to do if we, if we trying, if we say that we have positive answer to our question, we say that we have to reject null hypothesis in favor of this alternative. So the statement that people in Moscow, in fact, on average, are uh, taller than 167, uh, from mathematical point of view, is stated uh, in this way, that the actual population mean is larger than 167. This is exactly our alternative hypothesis. And what we want to do is to reject this null hypothesis in favor of this alternative. This is mathematical statement of uh, our problem. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now uh, we do the following. Uh, we do the following reasoning. Um, our strategy is the following. Uh, first, we believe for a second that null hypothesis holds. Uh, so if null hypothesis holds, then it means that uh, mu actually equals to 167. Then uh, we construct a theoretical distribution uh, of sample means. Uh, for our sample size uh, provided that null hypothesis holds. So uh, these two steps are uh, kind of theoretical steps. We don't consider our data so far. 
uh, what we wanted to do is uh, to draw a picture like uh, the following. If you remember the previous uh, the previous classes, the previous lesson, uh, you can you can suggest how this distribution of sample means uh, looks like if we believe that null hypothesis holds. And uh, if null hypothesis holds, then population uh, population mean is actually 167. So, uh, what uh, what uh, what should I do now? Now uh, I, I do some uh, some imaginary experiment, uh, some uh, some speculation. Uh, I say the following: Okay, let us believe that uh, in fact people in Moscow uh, have an average height of one hundred sixty-seven. Uh, what kind of sample averages uh, can I obtain? if I uh, will do uh, our sampling procedure several times, like 1,000 times. Every time I will get different uh, sample average and I'm interested in their distribution. So I want to draw a histogram of a distribution of these sample averages. Uh, we did exactly this thing uh, on the previous lesson. Uh, when we uh, uh, fixed our population and uh, obtained uh, a lot of samples from this population. And for each sample, uh, we found uh, its sample average and then plotted a histogram for this sample average. So now we have to do exactly this thing. And what will be our result? Uh, if I want to draw a histogram of these uh, of these sample means sample averages, uh, provided that uh, null hypothesis holds, where uh, it will be located on this line. How it should look like. Do you mean that we should uh, like first specify the mean? Or is it? Can you repeat, please? Do you mean that we should uh, specify on this line where the mean is? Uh, yes. Uh, let us put let us put the actual mu somewhere somewhere here. This is our mu. This is our population mean. So, and how the distribution of sample averages will be located? with respect to this population mean? Mm, the biggest number of sample averages should be exactly at the point of mu. Um, and, not basically exactly, but somewhere, uh, yeah, somewhere close. Yeah. It, is actually, uh, it is actually more or less impossible to obtain exactly this number. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good picture. Maybe something like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, if I if I if I would draw if I would draw the histogram, this histogram uh, will be like like this. Um, it is possible to obtain a sample average that is far from the population average, but a probability is very small. And uh, the largest probability lie uh, just near this near this population mean. This is exactly what we discussed on the previous lesson. So this uh, this picture is distribution of uh, sample. So this is sample means. Note that this is a kind of theoretical picture. Uh, I just say that I believe in my null hypothesis. I believe that population mean is located somewhere here. I don't know this number. I don't know this number. No, this is theoretical picture. And uh, sorry, uh, uh, I know. Um, sorry, no, I know because I um, because I th I believe in null hypothesis. So uh, I know that. Uh, um, 
I believe now for a second that uh, this mu is equal to 167. And uh, what should I do next? And uh, then uh, I put somewhere on this picture, I put my actual, my actual sample mean, uh, like 169.4. It will be located, for example, somewhere here. This is my uh, observed observed sample mean. So uh, this is a theoretical distribution. Uh, of sample means. Uh, provided that null hypothesis holds. And uh, this is my observed sample mean. And uh, what should I do next? What is my next step? As we did it before to check uh, mm -hmm. the probability of getting in each of us. Mm -hmm. The probability of what? Uh, of getting this um, sample mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, the idea is uh, the same as we discussed previously when we discussed uh, binomial test is that we have to compare, we have to, we have to check um, how this, uh, our actual observed sample mean, uh, which is in this case, it is uh, 169 and four. Uh, how it is related to this theoretical distribution. I mean that, uh, assume that we have, I uh, assume that our observed sample mean is somewhere here. Um, then we can conclude uh, that we have data uh, such uh, that, uh, that is too contradicting to the null hypothesis. So this picture, this distribution is drawn under the assumption that null hypothesis holds. So if we have observed value somewhere here, it is highly unlikely to obtain this value if null hypothesis holds. The probability of obtaining this value is very, very, very small. And in this case, uh, we, have to, we have to reject possible explanation that null hypothesis holds, but our data, our difference uh, is due to chance. And in this case, we reject null hypothesis. But if we are uh, somewhere here, again, uh, we see that observed data is larger than mu. But we say, yes, it is larger, but it is not surprising because we see that uh, the probability to obtain values here, to obtain values that are as large as our observed value it is uh, not very small. It is okay even if uh, null hypothesis holds, it is perfectly okay to obtain values, for example, here. It is possible. The probability of this event is not small. So uh, we put somewhere a threshold. Uh, we put a threshold uh, such that if uh, our value is uh, large enough, uh, if it is uh, to the right from the threshold, if it is larger than threshold, then uh, we will reject null hypothesis. And if it is uh, to the left from the threshold, then uh, we will not reject null hypothesis. So we will put uh, somewhere our rejection, rejection region, for example, here. So 
we have here rejection region. And uh, if uh, if we have observed value here, then we will reject null hypothesis. We will say that, um, no, we don't believe in such a coincidence. Like we don't believe that uh, people without uh, uh, any special abilities can guess, uh, for example, 100 coin tosses uh, out of 100. This probability is too small to be compatible with uh, our hypothesis that uh, this person guesses just by chance. And here, uh, it is the same reasoning. Uh, we say that if we obtained uh, our data point that lies here, uh, it is uh, not, it is incompatible in a sense with our null hypothesis because probability to obtain this data uh, provided that null hypothesis holds is too small. And this is actually what we do uh, every day uh, we actually we test uh, we test this statistical hypothesis every day just because that, but we don't know it but we do these kind of things for example if you look at the bath and uh, you see uh, and you see for example that uh, out of five uh, people uh, that uh, you see in the bus uh, four of them are children uh, then uh, you probably conclude that uh, this is a school bus uh, and not just an ordinary bus, uh, just because you know that in ordinary bus, uh, the probability to obtain uh, uh, four children out of five randomly selected, uh, uh, randomly selected passengers is too small. This is, this is the same story, okay? So uh, we select some threshold. Uh, some threshold. Uh, let me denote this threshold by, um, I don't know, X critical, uh, such that if X bar observed is larger than X critical, we reject null hypothesis. Uh, yeah, uh, we say that. What is X critical, the maximum? Uh, this X critical is this, uh, is the, is this threshold. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is X critical. And uh, uh, we will discuss how to choose this X critical just in a second. Uh, but now I'm just uh, stating the decision procedure. My decision procedure is the following. I found X critical in some way. And then uh, I uh, defined this rejection region. If I get, uh, if I get um, the observed sample mean, uh, that is greater than this X critical, then I say that it belongs to this rejection region. And in this case, I reject null hypothesis. So I say that um, people in Moscow indeed larger, uh, taller than people, in than people in the United States, than 167. Otherwise, uh, I do not reject null hypothesis. So basically, I say nothing. Uh, X bar, uh, so X bar observed, uh, this is our, uh, this is our observed sample average. This is actually the value that we obtained, like uh, like 169 and four. This is denoted by this X bar observed. So we have a sample 
we can find a uh, sample average and uh, put it here. Uh, why I put here observed? Uh, this is because uh, we have two kind of samples in this story. Uh, on one hand, we have an actual sample that, that we have in our data. On the other hand, we have uh, these imaginary uh, samples that we um, uh, that uh, that we obtain from this uh, population um, theoretical population with this population mean. Uh, so to distinguish between these two uh, these two samples, I put this observed uh, as uh, an index. No, I mean, what does bar sign mean? Bar, uh, so... bar is just bar, bar. Bar is just average. Uh, okay. So x so denotes e uh, uh, x x denote uh, x denote the whole sample, and I put bar uh, to denote a uh, sample average. Mm, so we can use like z bar, y bar, etc. Yes, and, yes, yes, uh, yes. It will be average. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, now uh, let me ask you how to choose uh, this X critical. Uh, again, uh, I want to control type one errors, type one error rate. So how to choose? X critical. Uh, I want so uh, let me return to this picture. And uh, I want to ask you uh, how to find a probability to make type one, uh, type one error if uh, my decision-making procedure is uh, as described. If I have some X critical and I will reject null hypothesis if I'm here. Uh, let me recall that uh, type one error is uh, that type one error uh, is an error uh, when we reject null hypothesis, uh, provided that null hypothesis holds. So, uh, in fact, people in Moscow are not taller than 167, but we say that they are taller. And this is called type one error. And uh, how to find using this picture, uh, the probability of type one error, provided that null hypothesis holds. how to find probability of type one error. I don't ask you about the number, I just ask you about the idea. We have this picture and uh, this picture is distribution of theoretical sample means uh, that is drawn uh, under assumption that null hypothesis holds. So if null hypothesis holds, your distribution is like this. And you will reject null hypothesis if you are here, what is probability to reject null hypothesis? How to find it? Maybe we should count uh, the number of all observation in the area uh, to the right of the threshold and yes, divide exactly. them. Mm -hmm, exactly, yeah. Uh, we, have, uh, we have to find actually this, uh, this area and divide it by uh, the area of uh, the, whole, the whole histogram. And um, after that, uh, 
indeed, uh, just by just by construction, uh, we have the probability of type one error. So the, on this picture, type one error happens every time. If we believe in null hypothesis, uh, then uh, we understand that our x bar uh, x bar is distributed according to this this shape. And every time when you reject null hypothesis, you will make type one error. So every time uh, when you are here, you will make a type one error. And the probability is uh, defined by this uh, by this area. So if I want to if I want to um, so we select x critical in such a way uh, that probability uh, to obtain x bar uh, larger than x critical. Oops. Uh, so uh, the probability to obtain x bar uh, larger than x critical is less than uh, the significance level. So uh, I want uh, I want my uh, x critical to be uh, such that uh, this this area is uh, like five percent of the whole picture. I want the probability to be here uh, to be equal to five to five percent. This is our significance level. What do you mean? What should be five percent? Um, let me uh, let me uh, redraw this picture a little bit. Uh, if I have a lot of uh, observations, uh, I can make uh, this uh, histogram. Uh, the rectangles in this histogram uh, more and more uh, narrow and then instead of drawing the histogram i will draw uh, just a curve and uh, then i can redraw uh, this picture in the following way i have uh, mu uh, like 167 and uh, i have this distribution of my, this is a theoretical distribution of sample means. And uh, now uh, what, uh, what does it mean? Uh, for example, if uh, I'm interested in uh, what is the probability to obtain a value that is larger than uh, this value uh, from this distribution. I just have to find uh, the area under the curve. I just want to find this area. Uh, this area, so let this be x critical. Uh, then this area is probability uh, that x is larger, that x bar is larger than x critical, uh, provided that null hypothesis holds. So uh, basically, I draw uh, I draw this curve, and I assume that the area under the whole curve equals to one. And uh, this curve. Uh, this is a generalization of, uh, of histogram. It shows uh, how probable is, uh, how likely is to obtain values uh, in different parts of, uh, of our line. For example, it shows that it is more probable to obtain value here uh, than here. And numerically, uh, to find probability uh, that we obtain a value in some interval, like in this interval, equals to uh, the area under this curve. 
over this interval. For example, if I'm interested in how probable it is to obtain uh, X bar on uh, oh, oh, that is that lies in this segment, I have to find uh, this uh, this area. And uh, you see that uh, the larger value of the function, uh, the larger area I have. For example, if I draw the same segment, but here, I will obtain a much larger area here. So I will interpret these areas uh, as uh, corresponding probabilities. And uh, then uh, I just say that uh, I want to select my X critical in such a way that uh, this area is 5%. Because uh, this area equals to the probability of my rejection. And uh, this is exactly uh, what I want. I, I want to, I want to uh, control uh, my type one error rate. So select X critical in such a way that probability to obtain X bar larger than X critical is less than or equal to significance level. And yeah, uh, 5%. So uh, note that uh, this curve uh, is obtained from, from theory. Uh, this curve is in a sense imaginary. This curve represents our possibilities that can take place uh, if null hypothesis holds. I say that if null hypothesis holds and my mu, my population mean, in fact, this one, uh, then I will get uh, different values of my sample that lie uh, somewhere here, somewhere here, maybe somewhere here, but probability to obtain value somewhere here or somewhere here is extremely small. And this is, uh, this is my uh, theoretical, theoretical picture. And then I look at the, at the actual data and compare this data with this theoretical picture. If I see my data somewhere here, I say that no, uh, this data point uh, contradicts to null hypothesis too much. The probability uh, to obtain this data, uh, provided that null hypothesis is true, uh, is too small because the value of this curve is, is very small here. And uh, this is an argument to reject null hypothesis just because we don't believe in um, two, uh, two narrow uh, coincidences, coincidences with too small probability. Uh, and this is how these uh, things work. So, uh, other questions? I believe you have some. Why so, do we uh, have, mm -hmm. yes? Why do we have this X critical only on the right side? Why don't we have it on the ah, left side? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, this is because the question that we stated initially is uh, the following. Uh, it is a kind of uh, one-sided question. Is it true that people in Moscow on average are taller than 167? Uh, we are not interested in uh, answering uh, on the opposite question. Is it true that uh, they are um, smaller than 167? Uh, this is this is how our question was stated. It is possible to state uh, to ask to ask uh, symmetrical questions. This is called symmetrical alternative. But now I just want I just want this one-sided alternative just because it is easier to think about it. And uh, now. Um, Uh, this can is, you this show? Is, can you show the picture the significance level? Uh, the significance level on this picture 
yes. is uh, is this area under the curve, the area of this part. So I select this x critical in such a way that the that uh, this area is equal to the significance level, because this area is my probability of rejecting null hypothesis, provided that null hypothesis holds, and I want this probability to be smaller than or equal to the significance level, not larger than the significance level. Mm -hmm. This is why I select this X critical in this way. Thank now, you. That, mm -hmm. now that the significance level is probability, this is very important. And uh, probabilities on this picture are areas under, 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 under this curve. So uh, let us make a 10 minutes break now. And then uh, I think I will steal a very small amount of time from the exercises, I hope. Uh, only five minutes I need to introduce p-value in this setting. And then we will switch to, to exercises. So 10 minutes break now. Ah, I want to ask about you wrote that if we have questions about homework, we can organize something like consultations. Yes, what, the, what, sure. what do you mean by, by it? I mean that you can write me, uh, 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 and yeah, I, uh, I have a question about the homework. Uh, I will answer. Uh, okay, uh -huh. uh, let us arrange a consultation at uh, uh, some mutually, uh, mutually uh, available time and we will uh, meet with you uh, in Zoom and we will discuss your questions. Ah. So this is exactly what <laughs> what I wrote. No, I mean, I mean that maybe you meant by consultations like just a chat, but you mean like a real meeting in Zoom? Yes, if it is needed, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sometimes, sometimes it is uh, it is enough to, to chat in Telegram if you have just a question like, am I correct in this or that? Uh, and I will say yes and so on. But if, uh, if any of you need uh, more explanation, uh, then I will be happy to, to give these explanations. Mm -hmm. That's no problem. Okay, thank you. Usually teachers mm -hmm. do not do like that. <laughs> Probably, but uh i do okay thank you a lot okay so we have a break now and you can think about your questions uh during the break
Uh, so we can probably continue. And uh, I have several questions. Uh, so uh, Anna, Anna asks uh, about uh, the the five percent part here, as far as I understand. Yeah, look, uh, if uh, if your if your observation is somewhere here, like in this tail, uh, in this uh, in this setting, if you ask if you ask this question. Uh, is it true that people in Moscow on average are taller than uh, 167? Uh, then uh, this data is not uh, an evidence in favor of uh, answering yes of this on, on this question. It is not an argument uh, in favor of a positive answer uh, for this question. It is not, uh, it is not uh, some data that is in favor of this alternative. Uh, so yes, in this case, if uh, if you get a uh, data point somewhere here, you say that you do not reject null hypothesis. Uh, it doesn't mean that you believe that null hypothesis holds. It just says that you don't have enough data to reject null hypothesis and not uh, simply reject null hypothesis, uh, but reject null hypothesis in favor of this alternative, of, of this one-sided alternative like uh, we discussed here. Uh, it is possible to state a different alternative. Uh, for example, it is possible to state alternative uh, like a symmetric one. Mu is not equal to 167. But uh, in this case, our decision-making procedure will be a bit different. There will be a, uh, a rejection region, symmetrical rejection region. Uh, like you will reject uh, your null hypothesis here and here. And your critical value will be calculated in a bit different way. But anyway, uh, if you have this uh, this setting, uh, then yes, uh, this data point uh, is not a data point in favor of this alternative. So you would not reject null hypothesis in this case. Uh, Aigul asks, uh, what happened uh, if the distribution of the sample mean were different? Uh, we will uh, we will cover it uh, right now. Uh, but the main idea is that due to central limit theorem, uh, the distribution of uh, averages uh, is more or less the same in any case. Uh, so it can be uh, different, uh, meaning that it can be more narrow like this, or it can be uh, less uh, narrow, more wide like this. But uh, the, the figure is more or less the same. This is this bell-shaped curve. This is what central limit theorem says us. And this is actually what makes uh, all this statistical stuff possible. But uh, what will we do uh, when we have different curves here? Uh, we'll discuss it right now. So okay. distribution as a straight line is impossible or meaningless uh, just, ju just, just, just a straight line of just from negative infinity to plus infinity like this. Uh, it is more or less impossible because you cannot, you cannot pick a random value from the whole line with the same probabilities. Uh, so there is no uniform distribution on the whole line. Uh, so actually, you will get different. Uh, different versions of normal distribution, which is uh, this bell-shaped curve. And uh, in fact, um, so um, I, have, I have two, two points uh, to add to my lecture. Uh, first point is about p-value. Uh, what is p-value? If you have some uh, observed value like this, this is x bar observed, then uh, you can find a p-value, which is a probability to obtain uh, this value or more extreme, in this case, more to the right. So this probability 
is p value uh, that depends on uh, our x bar observed. And now, if I look at this picture, and uh, I know that And I know that my uh, critical region uh, here uh, is selected in such a way that uh, this area is 5%. Uh, and then I know the following. If uh, I'm here, uh, if my X observed is somewhere here, what can I say about its P value? Uh, so uh, p value is this area, and uh, this area includes this area. So it means that if uh, my x observed is to the left from my x critical, then so if x observed bar is less than x critical, uh, then p value is larger than 5%. And uh, otherwise, if x uh, observed is larger than x critical, it means that uh, I'm somewhere here. And it means that p value, which is this area, is smaller than 5%. So uh, my uh, decision rule now uh, can be restated in terms of p-value. Uh, if p-value is smaller than the significance level, then reject null hypothesis. Otherwise, do not reject null hypothesis. So uh, again, uh, p-value is the probability to obtain the data that we actually obtained, that we observed, or more extreme data, provided that null hypothesis holds. So let me write it once again. This is probability to obtain data uh, that we actually obtained and that we actually observed. Or, or more extreme, uh, provided that null hypothesis holds. So this is uh, this is what p-value means. And uh, during exercises, uh, you will use function t-test. Uh, that will calculate this p-value for you. So actually, uh, the the only uh, thing that you have to do is to compare the, this p-value with uh, your significance level, your 5%, and then make a decision. But of course, to uh, make everything correct, you have to understand what does it mean. And um, are there any questions about this part? My question is, uh, are we going to discuss the mathematics that is behind the t-test? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, I want to discuss... Uh, uh, I want, uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, I want to discuss the actual formulas. Oh, uh, probably uh, I, I will write uh, the formulas sometime. Uh, but um, but uh, actually the main idea is uh, is what is written in this picture. And uh, my next, uh, and I just wanted to add uh, another thing that is more related with t-test uh, actually, but uh, these pictures are more important than formulas, I believe. 
but if you have any questions about uh, mathematical details, I will be happy to answer. Um, so uh, uh -huh. let me, yeah. E value is a percent of error, yes? Uh, yes, it can be seen, uh, it can be seen. Okay, so uh, we, use, we use this curve uh, to describe uh, the distribution of theoretically possible uh, values of sample averages provided that null hypothesis holds. So basically p-value is probability, but we visualize this probability using this curve as area under this, under this curve, area under this curve over some regions. Now uh, we have condition uh, that actually observe or more extreme. It means that uh, from this point to the right, this, this area. Mm. I just want to add that, uh, uh, could, uh, could you repeat please what you said, like uh, it is a, like a percentage of error? Because actually yeah, of, of, of area. Of just, ah, okay, okay, sorry. No, no, I said of error, of mistake. Ah, uh, so of mistake. basically no. <laughs> so that's the problem no. because, uh, because uh, the concept of p-value is, uh, is yes, it's uh, based on uh, the idea of null, uh, uh, null distribution. And it's not about like, you are like, uh, you are sure, but like you have 5% of chance that you're, no, no, this definition is wrong because, because uh, you cannot say anything actually about uh, alternative hypothesis actually. Uh, only you can say that, well, based on the null hypothesis, like this uh, uh, result is somewhat surprising to you. And like, if no hypothesis is correct, like uh, in like uh, there is a, this uh, probability to get this and more extreme result. So yeah, uh, other like uh, definitions, like it's your, you, 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 uh, you, you, like uh, we discussed, it's, I, I mean, uh, yeah, maybe maybe India can correct me. Yeah, uh, yeah the, you, you, everything you said is correct. Yes, uh, actually, this is a misconception, uh, a very uh, a very um, it is uh, it is a rather popular misconception about p-value that p-value can be interpreted like a probability of error, but um, it is not actually a probability of error. Um, at least, at least this interpretation is a bit shaky. Uh, what uh, what we can say is the following: that our decision-making procedure, this this decision rule, if implemented correctly, guarantees us that if null hypothesis actually holds, then our probability to make a mistake using this uh, this decision procedure is uh, not more than the significance level. This is, this is the only guarantee that we have, in fact. Uh, it doesn't mean, uh, well, it is, it is rather tricky to interpret it in, in, in any other way. Uh, 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 actually, for example, in psychology, uh, there was a big discussion about that because uh, there were studies that showed that even like in common uh, textbooks uh, for like uh, general introduction to psychology books, uh, in many in many cases uh, uh, the, de uh, the definition for p-value is wrong, and that's pretty fun. Uh, well, and it's very common misinterpret. Like uh, p-value is very common concept to misinterpret, you know, yeah. uh, it's uh, very important to understand the logic of this, uh, like uh, sampling distribution uh, and uh, null hypothesis and what is p-value is and what is p-value mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Okay, uh, now uh, let me, uh, let me uh, say uh, just the second part of my addendum. Uh, what happens if we change uh, what happens if we change uh, parameters of our sample? Mm. 
uh, for example, uh, let us assume that uh, we have some uh, some story like this. So we have some value mu here, and we have some uh, and we have some x observed x bar observed here. But uh, let us assume that uh, we increase sample size. Uh, what happens? What happens then? Uh, what if uh, what changes if we have, for example, two samples with the same x bar observed, but different sample sizes? Uh, what uh, what changes uh, on our picture on this picture or on this picture or here? So uh, if what if Uh, what if we have uh, two samples uh, with the same average, but of different size? As we discussed previously, we have we should uh, obtain different results. You, you you said previously that the larger sample we have, the more convincing uh, our result. But uh, how to see it in 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 this picture? How to see it using using our decision making procedure? Mm. Maybe our histogram will be more uh, fine-grained, like more smooth, uh, with, with it, a larger sample size. It will be uh, it will be more smooth. Uh, okay, my uh, smoothness of my histogram uh, is uh, something very theoretical. I mean that uh, I can imagine that I generate thousands of uh, these samples. And each sample means that I put one point, one sample size on my histogram. And so uh, just increasing this number of virtual samples, I can make my histogram as smooth as, uh, as I want. This is why I draw this line and not, uh, and not a histogram. Yes, I just misunderstood. I think I will, I, it was not a number of samples, but the size of samples. Yes, yes, sample, yes, size of, size of one sample, yes. What uh, what 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 will change when I increase the size of sample? It is uh, it is a good idea indeed to think about this theoretical distribution, and how it will change if I increase sample size. This is actually exactly what we discussed on the previous lesson. Do you remember? Going to become wider. Uh, yes, uh, but uh, but quite opposite. If we increase if we increase sample size, it means that our uh, sample averages will be located more close to the population average or uh, far from the population average, if, if I increase sample size. Closer, probably? Closer, yeah. The, 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 largest, the larger sample size, the better I have an estimate for uh, my population mean. Uh, so uh, I will get uh, two different, different picture here. For example, uh, one picture is like this. Okay, let me, uh, let me draw even wider. So probably this is a picture for small sample size. And this is a picture for large sample size.
Okay. The larger sample size, uh, the closer uh, our sample uh, means to the actual population mean. And so for the same uh, sample average, I will get different p-values and I will get different, different thresholds and everything will be different. For example, if I'm thinking about p-value, for my small uh, sample, I will get this p-value, which is quite large. And for my uh, large sample, I will get this p-value, which is uh, much smaller. So uh, it is possible uh, that, uh, for example, for the same uh, X bar observed, I will get uh, different p-values. And if I uh, observe this, this value as a uh, sample average for small sample, uh, it will be not significant. I mean, we will not reject null hypothesis because this p-value may be large. But if I consider large sample size, uh, then my theoretical distribution of uh, of my uh, sample averages will be much more narrow, and the corresponding p-value will be much less, and it is possible that I will reject null hypothesis. So uh, you see that the same value of x bar observed uh, can lead us to different conclusion uh, depending on the size of the sample. And this is in agreement with our intuition. If we have large sample, then the same uh, value of difference of this difference uh, provide us uh, more evidence in favor of rejecting of null hypothesis, in favor of an alternative, in favor of the presence of significant uh, difference. Uh, so uh, actually the case of variance is a similar one the smaller uh, variance of our initial distribution, uh, the smaller uh, the smaller variance in our um, in the distribution of uh, averages, and so the picture will be like this and not like this. So again, the smaller the smaller variance, the better evidence we have. So in fact, uh, we see here that everything is in agreement with our intuition that we discussed uh, at the, the very beginning. So uh, that's all uh, for my lecture today. Are there any questions? So uh, I'm sorry for stealing again some minutes uh, from from the exercises. Um, now uh, I will pass a word to Ivan. Pom -pom. Okay. Hi again, everyone. So yeah, let's go to our studio and do some stuff. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry. Okay, so let's start with uh, uh, with the task uh, with the task that we have. Uh, so is it the true is it true that average of our sample larger than 118 in statistically significant way in other terms can we reject null hypothesis that the sample is obtained from the population with population mean that is equal to 180 in favor of on of an alternative that population mean is larger than 180 now okay so and we start with a sample right and we need to check it. So basically, let's create Sorry, one. Uh, Probably we can, uh, we can send a link uh, to uh, yeah, this yeah. Uh, RMD file so everybody can download it yes. and follow. I just, uh, I will add a link to, to Wiki just right now. And I will send it by uh, in Telegram too.
Okay, so you can uh, use this link and to find this page. Uh, okay, so let's try uh, this sample. Uh, and for this sample, you can uh, calculate uh, sample average. Um, I'm sorry, how to download this file as an RMZ file, so where to click? Well, actually, uh, you don't need really, uh, really uh, download it. You can you can download it or you can just uh, follow the link and open it this way. But also you can do it uh, another way. You can do it like you can just press roll. And uh, it depends actually, I think it depends on uh, your web browser because uh, here in Safari, I get this as a text file that, can, that I can uh, save as an RMD file. So have you worked with a RMD file, RMD, uh, file before? No. No, okay. So yeah. If you open, uh, uh, if you press row, I think it's the best way to download it. Yeah. If you press the row, uh, it's either uh, open this way and you can like uh, save the page as and uh, save it as RMB file, or you can just, uh, or maybe just uh, download it in your downloads folder. So it depends on your web browser. So basically this file is a, a text file uh, that you can open in RStudio. Where it is actually. Oh, sorry. You can open it, uh, you can save it in uh, as RMD file. Uh, no. This one, yes. Yeah, uh, and it's something that we use in R instead of uh, Jupyter notebooks. Uh, but basically it serves more, more, uh, more or less uh, the same purpose. Uh, so you can get something like a document where you can uh, insert some code and you can run this code. Uh, and this like uh, parts of code are called chunks. Uh, and, and then you can just uh, uh, init, it's called knitting uh, the document and it will be uh, created as a, uh, as a uh, HTML document or Word document or PDF document. So you can try it by yourself. Um, it doesn't work here because uh, because of something, because you need this, I think, because I need to install packages that uh, are not installed in my computer. And after that, uh, I can just create, uh, create a, a document from my uh, RMD file and it will be very nice. Okay, to, okay, I need to. Yeah. And let's see how it works. It usually works. Yeah. And then you create this file. So, uh, uh, Vanya, I'm sorry, I don't see your screen. Uh, right. Okay, could you could you could you say uh, say it uh, before? Okay, uh, okay, sorry. So yeah, uh, if you open this file in R Studio, this RMD file, it will be opened like this, and uh, you can see uh, there is something like a, a header in this page. Uh, there is something uh, some uh, kind of um, uh, specific uh, specific signs. So uh, and also you can see uh, that uh, there are some chapters. There are some parts with a code. Uh, they're called chunks, and uh, and you can run code in the chunks. 
And then if you press button need, and if you have pre-installed some packages that it will ask you to install like R Markdown and some others, uh, this will be, uh, this will create this kind of document. Uh, I think if you have uh, some experience working with uh, uh, Jupyter Notebooks, uh, it seems to you somewhat, uh, somewhat familiar. But actually, uh, it's pretty much different from Python Notebooks because Python Notebooks are actually rather complicated files. Uh, RMD files are just simple text files with specific formatting. Uh, this formatting is actually uh, based on uh, Markdown. Uh, Markdown is a, a very simple uh, language of, for markup. Uh, and it's actually, I think most of you knows, uh, most of you know what is Markdown, but maybe just write plus if you know what is Markdown and minus if you don't because it's pretty much, it's really interesting. Okay, plus, plus. I don't know what to write, but I remember a markdown from the Python courses. I remember that it somehow simplifies uh, the view yeah. of the code. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, like kind of, yeah. So basically, uh, Markdown, yes, is a is very simple. Uh, it's very simple markup language. Uh, it's so simple that it's used everywhere now. Like even in Telegram, for example, you can use part of Markdown syntax in uh, GitHub uh, for writing README and everywhere else. Uh, there are even like uh, uh, popular um, uh, notepads for like journals uh that you can where well, you can use this uh markdown and it will automatically create it in a very beautiful uh, way and many people with academic background use it because it's very common uh skill for now using markdown so basically what is our markdown our markdown is markdown uh just mark uh, markdown page with chunks of code and uh, these chunks of code uh, run when you need this document. So, uh, and they're integrated in our Markdown, uh, our Markdown uh, document. So uh, if, uh, if we uh, see how it works, uh, you can see that for, if you get some results in console, you get something like uh, this square, uh, in Markdown document and the same you have for uh, pictures. So if you have some plot inside our Markdown document, uh, you get a plot uh, in your uh, final HTML file. Alternatively, by the way, you can do it not like, uh, you can do instead of HTML document, you can do Word document. I'm uh, sorry, uh, it, it, is, it is your screen. Uh, I'm terribly sorry, yeah, but I, I'm... I don't understand what's happening, why it's not, okay, okay, sorry. Uh, but thank you, thank you, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, here, uh, it is a header. Uh, this header uh, uses uh, YAML language. It's uh, YAML stands for uh, yet another markup language, but then they they used uh, abbreviation YAML aren't markup language. So it's not a markup language, but here it's used uh, just for creating like uh, just for setting parameters uh, of the document. So for example, if I said HTML document, instead of, uh, instead of HTML document, I will use Word document. It will create a Word file. If, oh yeah, it creates.
so it is like a, a converter so it can convert to anything uh, if yes I... yes basically yes because markdown uh use uh, so for markdown inside there is a uh it is a responder that is used to convert from uh, markdown to everything else uh, pandak is a popular program uh, it's popular, like nerdy program, you know, uh, that converts from every uh, format to any and to all uh, to all other formats. You can see how it works. But first, uh, yes, yeah. So now we created, instead of uh, HTML document, we created a board document. This results. So you, you need to run this line to get a word document or what you need to do. Uh, so you I can just, just move to HTML to PDF to Word, or you can just change uh, here that you want, instead of HTML document, you want uh, Word documents or PDF document. Uh, for PDF document, it uses uh, it uh, it uses LaTeX. Uh, I think you know what LaTeX means, and this way this will be like that. So, if you saw uh, if you read some mathematical books, you know this style of um for um, printing so yeah it's all based on the uh on the pro program uh that can convert like from markdown to microsoft word to any other word like document to powerpoint to uh epub to uh, like uh, electronic books uh, and all other all other uh, formats to LaTeX to HTML and so on. Oh, even TI. It's something that is close to my uh, topic. Uh, so basically, R Markdown is a, a something like a wrapper. Uh, router uh, uh, our, um, on this uh, Pandek program that adds also a chance of uh, our code inside. Uh, and that's basically all. So with our markdown, uh, with our, our markdown you can create uh, like different kind of documents, presentations, uh, even websites, for example, or interactive dynamic presentations with JavaScript or whatever uh so yeah so uh if i told if i send you my uh if i showed you my uh uh website with materials on uh rn stats before uh this all like uh website was created actually in uh r markdown so basically just several R Markdown uh, documents uh, compiled together. Okay. Uh, and yeah, I think it's... Uh, okay, just return to how it was like, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and also with R Markdown, you can work uh, um, uh interactively so you can just uh run some code in uh uh in uh chunks and you'll get the result so it's really well integrated in uh, our studio uh environment so it's really nice to use so that's why we will use uh our markdown file uh and we'll work with it okay so uh okay uh we calculated mean uh and 
yeah, we can see that average for, for this sample uh, is bigger than uh, population mean uh, according our null hypothesis. But does it really that much bigger or maybe just uh, some error? So basically, yeah, uh, basically uh, you, use uh, you use statistical tests when you have like real serious alternative hypothesis that your uh, result, your differences uh, can be explained as some kind of noise. So uh, for example, if you, I know if you, um, for example, if you use uh, trans transcranial magnetic st stimulation over your motor cortex, uh, you press uh, uh, to get mag magnetic impulse and you, you see muscle twitch and I don't, uh, I don't uh, think that there is, uh, there is uh, a single article in the world uh, that uh, use some statistical test that tries to show that there is a muscle twitch because you just, you press a button and you see this muscle twitch. You know, like you, um, what else? You, 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 you use sugar inside water and you can see that there is no sugar anymore. It's a solution. You don't need to use statistics there. It's obvious. Uh, but what, when it's not obvious, uh, when you can say that, okay, maybe it's just some noise, maybe uh, it can be, you're not sure. You're not 100% sure that it is not just coincidence. Uh, in this case, you use statistical tests. And you start with a null hypothesis, uh, a null hypothesis uh, that there is no uh, differences, there are no uh, connections, uh, and so on. Or with some spe more specific hypothesis, like 180, like uh, we have it here. So yeah, it's larger than 180, but is it? Uh, is this uh, difference uh, significant? So how do you think? And why do you think so? Just, I want to hear your ideas. Uh, so it's about 5% uh, again. As we discussed it or, or yeah. not so yeah yeah uh, we have this threshold of five percent uh yeah so what do you think and why mm, so uh, it is smaller than five percent why do you have any clue mm. of it why, why why it is smaller yeah uh, um, because if we uh, divide um, one uh, hundred uh, eighty uh, to uh, hundred, we will get uh, one point eight. And if we uh, multiply by one point eight to uh, five, uh, we will get um, we will get uh, something uh, around uh, nine. And uh, it uh, it is more than uh, one hundred. Uh, 82.6. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, okay, let's test your intuition. And in this case, actually, uh, we can do it even by by hands, you know, without like function for the test. Uh, just using these functions uh, that we used like uh, previously, like uh, for RBNOM, GBNOM, uh, Kubinom and so on, we have the same function for T distribution. And T distribution is pretty similar to normal distribution, but it just has some heavier tails than normal distribution. So let me show you the distribution. Yeah, so. Yeah, it looks like that. 
And when your uh, sample size become larger, uh, the distributions uh, remind you normal distribution even more. So uh, with, uh, well, when uh, sample size tends to uh, infinity, a shape of key distribution tends to normal. But when a sample size is not so big, it has some heavier tails uh, because for t test, uh, we don't know uh, standard deviation in uh, po uh, in population, and we need to somehow uh, base our calculation on its estimations. So. I, I don't understand actually this logic like five for example. Okay. Uh, I, I just asked you so um, uh, if um, if we estimate uh, uh, this result uh, based uh, on this five percent uh, threshold that we discussed uh, today mm -hmm. with uh, Ilya or uh, do we not or we don't? Uh, yeah, but I mean, okay, okay, uh, okay. So uh, let us return to to the like uh, result that we have here, because uh, yeah, we, we can uh, we can calculate the test actually by ourselves uh, without using uh, this function. So we can even try to do that because it's not that hard. So we can get this p value and so on. Uh, so what we have is uh, we calculated uh, t statistics, the t statistic, uh, and based on our uh, sample size or sample size minus one, actually, we calculated p value. So how it works? So uh, we calculate t statistics. That's actually uh, will be. Um, mean sample minus uh, mu, right, divide by uh, standard error. And standard error is uh, sample one divide by, by square root of length of sample one. Yes, I think probably that. Uh -huh. No, something is wrong. What's wrong? Ah, yeah. Mm, no, something is wrong here. I think. Yeah. Yeah, so actually, you know, you can you can just calculate it by your hand if you want to, but you don't need to. Uh, just uh, average of the sample, so your x, uh, x bar uh, minus mu according to null hypothesis, divided by the uh, standard error of, uh, of the mean. Uh, that's actually is a, a standard deviation of uh, your sample divided by square root of uh, uh, n, so sample size. Uh, the standard error is also actually an estimation of standard deviation of sampling distribution for the test statistic. So uh, you, you calculate this t and uh, you can see this, uh, well, let's create a plot from three by zero dot one, just a vector uh, from minus three to three with some small step. And dt uh, of this vector with gf equal to four. Uh, degrees of freedom is uh, four, it's calculated as sample size minus one. 
and you can see the like the key distribution for uh, the stat statistic. And uh, what's actually we measure as p value is we can add this up line our uh, I think v equal to t. I'm not sure because I'm not experienced uh, experienced with uh, using base uh, r for plotting. Let's try two. Okay. Vertical line base R. Maybe you can do it here. Yeah, here it works. Uh, maybe it will be it will work in uh, like that. No. Hmm. Yeah, here it works. Uh, so basically, what we do here is we calculate uh this uh, uh density this area uh after this uh key value that is zero dot seven k something uh and yeah the whole area is one and the area is a part of uh this uh whole area that is uh, divided by this uh, line is actually our p-value. And of course we can calculate it using function pt. Uh, this you can just use this value t and df equal to four, but instead of because uh, with fun function pk, you calculate from minus infinity to uh, this line, you need to calculate area from the line to plus infinity. So that's why you use one minus. And you get this p value. So basically, uh, there is no like magic inside uh, this t test function. Uh, it calculate, uh, calculation is pretty simple. Uh, and it's good that you can understand what's going on there. Uh, it's quite typical uh, result uh, from uh, family of tests function in R. They are built in, so you can use you can use them uh, by yourself uh, without any uh, without uh, uh, installing uh, and attaching any additional language uh, any additional packages. Uh, yeah, and also you can save this result, t test results. And you can explore this uh, object because basically it's something like a list with some additional attributes uh, called h test. Uh, for example, if you want to uh, extract p value from those results, you, you can use just uh, this uh, dollar and that results dollar and p value, or you can even run it in one line. Uh, just calculate uh, just to use t test, and inside this result, without any assignment. Uh, just extract p value straightforward from the uh, calculation of uh, t test with the t test function. Voila. Uh, okay. So,
now we uh, calculated everything there. And if we can calculate it by ourselves, it means we understand it, right? So again, what is p value? p value here is 0, uh, 24 something, meaning that if our null hypothesis is true, null hypothesis is that true population mean, like super mega real population mean, like, I mean, it's real according to null hypothesis is 180. And if this is true, uh, the probability uh, of getting this result, well, uh, uh, getting this, uh, exactly this result uh, is actually zero because, well, uh, in real life, if you have continuous variable, uh, it will be like one, uh, 182, uh, point six, uh, two hundred eighty-two point six, two zero three four, and so on and so on. And uh, it's actually impossible to get exactly the same result uh, in uh, uh, meaningful uh, time. So even if you try to uh, reproduce it many times, you'll get something slightly different, right? So, so you're not interested in uh, what is the uh, probability of getting this result. You're interested in the probability of getting this result an even more extreme result means that uh, this p-value is a probability of getting uh, 182.6 and even more if no hypothesis is true. So what can we conclude based on this uh, p-value here? Try to like explain your conclusions about the null, hy the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. Your screen is gone again. Hmm? Sorry. Yeah, because your screen I, is I, gone. I, oh. yeah, because because I'm asking, because I'm asking you. <laughs> so yeah, we have this p value. What can we conclude here? It's too high, probably. <laughs> the too probability. High, uh, what do you mean, actually, by too high probability? I mean, like, um, what does it mean in reality for you? Mm, the probability to get this result uh, if uh, the null hypothesis holds. I mean, if our Mm, average is really 180. Mm -hmm. So we can get uh, 182 uh, with probability of 24%. Well, not one uh, 182.6, uh, but actually 182.6 uh, and higher. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's pretty important here. Uh, yeah. And why do you think it's high? Because it's actually, it's lower than 0 0.5, for example. Because it's much higher than the um, value that is commonly taken, commonly accepted. Yeah, it's uh, uh, higher than our common uh, threshold that is, uh, uh, 0 0.05 but I mean what does it mean in, in reality so you can you can you can say that in one if you repeat uh, this experiments uh, many times in uh, uh, one force uh, um, uh, one uh, in like almost 25 percent of situation you will get uh, uh, results that are even more extreme than your results. So like, okay, it's not very uncommon result to get there. So it's not, uh, uh, it's not really uncommon to, 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 to get these results. So maybe it is 
like uh, it is less probable to get uh, uh, this uh, results than uh, re re results that are less than uh, 182.6 and it's uh, three times uh, less probable, right? Because uh, it's oh, somewhat 75% that you have, uh, you'll uh, get a lower result and 25% uh, that you get higher result. But it's not that much because yeah, it can be, but it's not, that it is not, it is not a lot because uh, it is not enough to uh, say that we can reject our null hypothesis, our basic hypothesis, because we uh, we usually want to to have some convincing uh, results that will uh, make us believe that we can uh, reject our null hypothesis, that we can say, okay, we are not comfortable with our uh, null model of the world anymore. We need to uh, get more complicated uh, model of, of the world uh, than we have now. Because basically it's about uh, uh, Occam's principle, uh, Occam's, rather, uh, Occam's rather, uh, razor. So what a p-value should be here so we can reject null hypothesis. Yes, uh, like the very simple answer is that uh, if p-value is uh, less than zero dot, uh, 0 0.05. But do you remember why 0 0.05? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure that you discussed it with Elia, but why we have this threshold? Any ideas? Any ideas? Come on. This yeah, I mean, uh, basically just because one guy said that let's have 0 0.05. Actually, he said that, okay, it will be stupid to have uh, uh, some threshold like, for example, 0 uh, 0 0.05. And they, oh, okay, this very smart guy said that, uh, said some number and we'll use it. So there is no reason to use uh, exactly 0, uh, 0.05. It could be 0, uh, 0.01 and there are like discussions. Okay, uh, we have uh, too many false positive results. Let's use uh, 0 0.01 instead of uh, 0 0.05 or even lower. Or there is a, uh, another article called justify your alpha, it means that uh, for particular research topics, for particular research designs, you need to specify what is your uh, um, alpha and justify that, why you use it. And it's, I, I think there is some, it's somewhat rational because uh, actually, uh, for example, if you do some like medical research that shows that uh, your a new tablet is uh, works better than previous tablet, it's a bit different when you want to prove that uh, uh, phenomena, uh, ph phenomena exists and uh, well, like para parapsychology works, you know. And uh, in this case, in, even if you get a uh, p-value like uh, 0 0.02, maybe you're not very convinced, really convinced because you know that there are many people who try and of course you will not reject your uh, materialistic uh, point of view because you get p-value 0 0.02. Uh, uh, in the in some kind of parapsychological experiment. So yeah, that's important that uh, this number 0 0.05 is just uh, like threshold that was taken just because, just because, you know. Потому что потому. 
Uh, and there is no like real reason why this number is so important. And it's pretty common thing in statistics because uh, there are no like uh, strict uh, thresholds uh, that you can find there because, well, you know, distributions are usually smooth. Uh, you cannot uh, find like a threshold usually in real life, uh, in real life distributions, right? Uh, so, but people want to have one. And because people want some kind of a rule for decisions, they get one. But it's important that you understand that uh, this rule is pretty artificial. I mean, it's completely artificial. Uh, there is no logic why it, uh, people decided to use uh, 0 0.05 instead of 0 uh, 0.06. Well, at, at least 0 0.05 is, you know, nicer number and that's all. Okay, let's go further. Uh, can you can you yep. please explain what this uh, align with confidence interval mean? Uh, yeah, confidence uh -huh. interval. Be, I, I think uh, I think you 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 didn't study with uh, Ilya what is confidence interval. Um, well. And I'm not sure that it is a part of a program, but uh, it's actually a very interesting concept, but it's um, uh, it's actually very related to null hypothesis significance testing, but it's another approach to, um, to uh, make a decision about statistical hypothesis. Actually, mathematically, they, uh, they lead to, to, to exactly the same results. So it doesn't matter that you use like confidence intervals instead of p-values. But for now, uh, p-values are a bit more popular. Uh, so confidence intervals are basically uh, intervals that uh, you are 95% sure uh, contains true population mean. So let me show you some uh, very good Uh, illustration for that. Uh, so imagine that you calculate some, uh, you get some sample, you, you conduct some uh, experiment, you get some sample, you calculate uh, 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 these confidence intervals uh, by some formula and uh, 95 percent confidence interval means that uh, in 95 percent of cases more or less it will contain true population mean here is zero true population mean and you can see that in most cases it is sketched by uh, by this interval so it's from some point to another point and in some cases, it is not caged uh, by, uh, by this interval. So when you see red interval, it means that it failed to cage the real true population. And you can see that after some trials, it is 93%, but actually actual, uh, uh, confidence interval is 94 uh, in 95 percent. If you increase, I'm oh, sorry, not, not not this one. Increase speed, you'll get closer to this 95 percent eventually. And also, uh, uh, how can you control these intervals? So, for example, you can. Uh, decrease uh, your confidence. If you decrease your confidence, you can, uh, you can do mistakes uh, more often. Uh, 
and uh, it's, it actually means that you can make them uh, more narrow. So what if I ask you, what is your confidence interval for uh, together, uh, to tomorrow uh, temperature on the street? Pam Pam, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we hear. Okay, okay, so yeah, Anna, it's, uh, it seems that it's uh, only your problem. So check please your, I know, sound on your uh, phone or laptop. So uh, what if I ask you uh, uh, to say with 90% uh, uh, confidence, what is the weather tomorrow? I mean, temperature. It's lower than zero, probably. Lower than zero, probably, yes. Uh, well, and you, okay, you, 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 uh, you said about upper bound of the confidence interval, it's uh, zero. What is a lower bound for uh, your confidence interval for 90%? But okay, just say some some number. Uh, the problem is that people actually uh, are really bad in estimating uh, <laughs> these confidence intervals because uh, they're usually overconfident. Because if you, uh, I ask you uh, about some numbers that is very hard to estimate, like I don't know, like um, uh, let's say. Uh, the longest uh, uh, way uh, that you can go from one point uh, to another in Europe, for example, in kilometers or something like that. Or um, what is their uh, length of uh, uh, Eiffel's Tower in meters? Uh, and if I ask you about to set 90% uh, uh, confidence intervals, it means that you will be right in nine uh, times out of 10 and not more often, not less often. But people, if, if they ask about that, they usually do two narrow intervals and they usually do uh, mistakes and uh, in 50%. Uh, uh, so basically, we are wrong. Uh, we are really bad in estimating these confidence intervals. So what I wanted you to ask is that, yeah, okay, you say that uh, confidence interval for, to go, for tomorrow uh, weather is from, let's say, uh, I don't know what is, because yeah, I, I really don't follow uh, temperature, but I think it's from minus 30 to, to zero, because I'm really not sure about what's happening there. But if I ask you what is your 95% uh, confidence interval for uh, tomorrow uh, weather, you will have wider interval because, okay, you, you're, allowed, you're allowed to make even less mistakes. So you'll get, okay, from minus 40 to five degrees something like that. Uh, yeah, and also uh, if, you, if you talk about, uh, if you talk about uh, confidence intervals based on some uh, uh, sample estimations, uh, estimations from sample, of course, if you increase your sample size, your uh, confidence interval uh, will become more narrow. So we can try it like that. So you, you increase sample size and your confidence interval is more narrow. If you decrease sample size, you have wider uh, confidence intervals. Okay. 
So for example, here, uh, your confidence interval, uh, it's actually because you said hypothesis that is, uh, uh, you check uh, uh, it, like uh, your alternative hypothesis is that uh, uh, this, parameter is uh, greater than 180, right? In this case, it, uh, it's not bounded uh, from the right, but it's bounded from the left. So in this case, 95% uh, confidence intervals is from 175 and something to infinity. And it contains your null hypothesis parameter. That's why you cannot reject your null hypothesis uh, based on your confidence interval. So like uh, if uh, you have, for example, uh, uh, here a value that is larger than 180, you can say that, okay, my confidence interval uh, doesn't contain population parameters specified in null hypothesis. That's why I can uh, reject null hypothesis and uh, select uh, my alternative hypothesis. And in this way, actually, in all cases, when you will get a number here that is higher than 180, you will get the value that is less than 0, uh, 0.05. Because, well, mathematically, calculation of p-value uh, and uh, confidence interval, they interrelated things, you know. Okay. And now you need to repeat the things with data. But what, it, what I wanted to show you is uh, this simulation. Uh, let us test the t-test work as expected. Uh, so it gives false positive results in five uh, percent times or less. To do it, consider the following simulation. Okay, let's do that. Uh, but the only thing that I want to do, simulation mean, uh, I want to write write it a bit. Uh, I want to to do it without uh, for loops. I want to to use uh, function replicate, and then I can just uh, replicate it. Uh, number of samples times, number of sample times. And I will do t test. Uh, sample relation size, sample size, and so on. Yeah, new equal to population mean. And alternative less. And yeah, I can do calculate p value right here. And I will get a vector of p values there. Let's see how it works. I will p will call, call many p. We have many p values there from many replications. So what what we do there? Uh, we have some kind of population here, just these numbers. Uh, and we do some samples from the population. Every time we get a uh, sample size uh, 20, so we get 20 numbers from this uh, random variable. Uh, and repeat this, uh, and then we uh, calculate t-test using this uh, data uh, compared to population mean. Uh, and calculate p-value. Actually, we tested against uh, our 
uh, real population mean? It means that in this case, we know, we really know that our null hypothesis is really true. I mean, it's definitely true because uh, we know it in advance because uh, we just uh, calculated mean from this vector. And this vector is our like uh, uh, population uh, distribution. So we know this distribution. We know that uh, uh, we know this mean actually. Uh, so in this case, if we will do t test, uh, we will expect that uh, false positive results. So p value is less than zero uh, point zero five. We will re receive it in less than five percent of cases. So let's try to do the simulation. Uh, yeah, we need to some we need some time to wait because you know it's quite long actually. Yeah, we calculated. And here we can see this like vector of p values. And we can co compare this p, uh, vector of p values to 0, 0, 0,5. And we will get a uh, logical vectors where we get a logical vector where we get a uh, true if this p value is less than uh, 0 0.05 and uh, false otherwise. And we can then calculate, so it will be like this, false, 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 and sometimes true. So how do you think, how often we'll get, uh, how often we'll get uh, p values that are less than 0, 0, uh, 0, uh, 0.05. What do you think? Not often, maybe. Yeah, but how often? Do you have a guess? It is actually... Hmm? Sorry? I'm not sure in my answer, Sasha, so you can uh, press it. I'm also not sure. Maybe it is 5% uh, of 1,000, but I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 exactly. So we will get, I think we will get something like that. Actually, yeah. Actually, uh, it is something like that. It is not exactly like that. Like that. Uh, actually, maybe it's because of uh, we have this strange population, but I, I don't think it's, it really, uh, it matters much. But maybe if we get uh, if you do another simulation, it will be slightly higher than zero dot zero five, and this time it's slightly lower than uh, zero point zero five. So yeah, in approximately uh, 0 0.05 cases, percent, uh, 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 yeah, in uh, approximately 5% of cases, we will get p value less uh, than 0 0.05 in case our null hypothesis is really true. And here we know that it's true. Just very specific case when we know that it's true. Uh, we can even draw a histogram for this uh, p-values. How do you think it will look like? It's actually a difficult question. Imagine what will be a, a shape of p-values distribution? When your null hypothesis is uh, well, you know, no hypothesis is uh, true. Just try to guess. It's it's okay to have a not correct answer, and it's okay that you don't know uh, the name of the distribution. You can just say it will be like that, or it will be like that, or it will like it will look like uh, um, George Bush. 
I thought to... maybe it will be the normal distribution like like this bell type um yeah maybe but no i think it's just a line yes you have really good uh like uh, statistical intuition that's really it's really nice because yeah it will be like a line so where it is yeah so it will be flat it will be uniform distribution and if you put here uh, a vertical line and the line be equal to your really fine. Yeah, like uh, everything below this uh, vertical line is somewhat 5% of the cases. I think it will be better if we get breaks 100. Yeah, and a line will, will go like all equal to blue. Yeah. Okay, do you understand this? Because if you understand this, I can show you something a bit more complicated. Uh, but that's pretty important though to understand uh, uh, statistics actually. So what is interesting to see is to, uh, to see how this, uh, uh, how this uh, distribution of p-value will, uh, will look like if our null hypothesis is not true. We'll, we can do the simulation, we can do that easily just with few uh, changes in our code. Uh, and you can think how this uh, distributions of p-value will look like uh, if we plot a histogram. Try to imagine, try to think that like uh, this, so everything below this uh, 0 0.05 line is approximately 5%. So imagine that uh, our population mean, what is our population mean by the way? It's uh, do not say it's 44. Okay, let's see it's, let's say that our population mean is equal to 14. I don't know, just for example. In this case, we will know that uh, our null hypothesis is wrong. And well, uh, and let's see how, uh, how, how it will change our results. So we calculate many P's again. And what do you think, how often uh, uh, this p values will be less than 0 0.05. Do you think it will be In more? 100% of the cases. 100% of the cases. Well, I'm not sure that it will be 100% of the cases. Uh, Okay, uh, I'm sure that it will be not 100% of the cases because actually difference is not so much because so there is uh, some uh, uh, some effect there, but in many cases uh, we will not catch it. So our p value will be uh, higher than 0, uh, uh, 0 0.05. Let's see how often. Actually, in most cases, it will be higher than 0 0.05. Uh, and uh, it means that in 90% of cases, we will do what kind of error? Do you remember two types of error? One. No, not the first one, not type one, but type two, because type one is when we, uh, when we have no, uh, no uh, effect, but we, our, uh, our uh, statistical test says that we have. 
So we have p value less than 0, uh, 0, 0.05, but there, there is no effect. It's uh, what we did previously, right? And we checked that, yeah, in 5% of cases, we'll do, we'll have this type one error, or more or less 5% of cases. In this case, it's different because we, we really have some effect, but this effect is uh, rather small. And it's related to the concept of statistical power. So uh, probability of obtaining statistically significant results if there are some. Uh, and uh, imagine how uh, distribution of key values will be, uh, how they, uh, they will be distributed. What do you think? What do you expect as a distribution of for uh, p values there? Any ideas? Okay, just uh, let's uh, go from the previous point. Previously, it was flat, more or less flat. You know, if you get not uh, uh, 10 thousands uh, of samples, but 10 millions, it will be very flat, you know. Uh, okay, but what do you think will be flat here? If you draw uh, these p-values. Well, it will, it won't. And it will be somewhat skewed and skewed to very like specific location. So when you have, uh, okay. sorry. And this one. I'm oh, sorry. Right. And right. So in this case, it will be skewed, and uh, here you have more p values on this side. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, if you have some real effect, uh, if some real effect exists, uh, you'll get p uh, values that are less than uh, 0 0.05 in more than 5% of cases. So, and the bigger your effect, the more skewed the distribution of p values will be. So, let's check not for 14, but for example, for uh, 20. Okay. okay, let's try. So in this case, effect is really big. So what do you think what will uh, happen to uh, per, uh, percent of uh, p-values that are less than 0, 0, 005? it will be higher. So you can see that like, yeah, now it's almost 100%. Because you test again the null hypothesis that the true mean is uh, 20. But in, in reality, you have only two values there uh, that are more than 20. So in most cases, when you sample from this uh, population, you will get uh, statistically significant results when you uh, test uh, your sample against a uh, population mean that is 20. And if you see how, uh, no, again, Russ, you can see that. Uh, you, you can't even hear, uh, you can't even see the values that are higher than 0, 0, 008 here. And it's very skewed to the left part. So almost 100% of cases, you get a p value that is less than 0, uh, 0.05. 
Okay, I understand that this demonstration is somewhat difficult because it's quite abstract uh, uh, and it involves like idea of um, like uh, repeating many experiments. But actually there are many interesting things that are based on this kind of distribution. Uh, of p-values, for example. Uh, for example, there is some uh, such thing like meta-analysis uh, that you probably know, know uh, uh, when you take many uh, studies together and you try to uh, statistically uh, like combine them in one study. And one of the popular methods for now for using of uh, study uh, of meta-analysis is uh, uh, exploring uh, uh, p-curve, so curve of p-values in uh, many, uh, from many studies. So if you get something like here or something like what we have in the uh, previous picture, it means that, okay, it seems that overall the effect exists uh, and we can conclude that, yeah, uh, this uh, 100 uh, articles can, uh, from 100 articles, we can conclude that, yeah, effect exists and we can say it uh, for sure. If we see something like that, if we take uh, p values from many studies with similar designs, for example, uh, if you study whether uh, bilinguism uh, influence uh, intelligence, there are many studies that uh, try to challenge this problem. And if you combine p values from many uh, many of the studies and plot it and show, and you will see this line, it means that yeah. Most probably, it really this effect really exists, and bilingualism increases intelligence of children. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Maybe you have any questions? Just ask questions. In this example, if your population mean is too low, like five, um, will the result be the same? The histogram. Uh, population or sample? No, if your population mean in this um, call you show, yes, you, you've increased it to 20, but if it's five. Uh, Let's try. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, here that uh, according to our hypothesis, uh, uh, it is less. Yeah, so, uh, uh, usually, actually, we don't do it like this. We usually uh, use uh, to test, so two two way hypothesis, and it means that uh, when we have this, uh, okay, you let's just take some random uh, figure. Uh, it means that uh, in reality, and uh, yeah, we'll explain it for sure. Uh, um, we usually do two-tailed tests, uh, especially for t-test. So uh, we are not sure in this case, like we are sure that our value is less or uh, higher than our uh, population mean. And we test this hypothesis. When we are not sure, and it may be in both ways, we calculate both this area and like the symmetric area from the left. And practically means that we multiply our p-value by two. So if we do, uh, uh, if we use instead of alternative less, uh, I don't remember how it's called, just two-sided, two-sided. Two-sided, it will, I think it will be still something like that because uh, because actually, I mean, the difference is even higher, yeah. So in 100% of cases, 
uh, it is uh, statistically significant. But it's not something that you have in real life. It means like uh, your null hypothesis is that um, well, then what it can be, I don't know, actually, five. Okay, just for example, it's, it, it will be not normal distribution, but imagine like, uh, oh, okay, that, uh, that uh, your diet that you use uh, uh, by null hypothesis, it uh, uh, change your weight by five kilograms, but in reality you have uh, uh, these values. Or for example, you compare your diet, your new diet to another diet. And you have some basic null hypothesis diet and you know that this, uh, this basic diet uh, change uh, weight by five kilograms. And your new, uh, and, uh, your new diet, uh, diet uh, change your uh, uh, weight by one of these numbers. So, okay, if you get these results in real life, you'll definitely think that uh, your diet works better, maybe even without uh, uh, checking statistical results, because you know, like in almost every case, it changed uh, your weight to much more than five kilograms. So imagine in, in real life, like, uh, diet A changed your weight by five kilograms and diet B changed your uh, weight by an average 12 and something kilograms. And you're like, okay, I don't, I don't even need statistics there maybe because it seems that this is uh, clearly not something like random. But if you want to be sure that it's not some random noise, of course you do uh, this uh, t-test. Okay, any other questions? Because yeah, it's nice, well like, okay, and what if we do not 20 but five and you can just try it by yourself with R and it's so nice, I really like it. Because I, I, I really spent a lot of time uh, playing with uh, different things like that. And I'm really happy that Ilya included uh, this in this uh, RMD file, uh, especially if you try it on other distributions other than normal, you will see why uh, CLT works. Because uh, actually, if you, even if your uh, samples comes from distributions that are not normal, uh, this t-test and other uh, statistical tests will more or less work with not so high error. So if you uh, uh, do this initial replication when you have null hypothesis that is true, uh, but not, not, not on like uh, uh, distribution that resembles normal, but on very skewed distribution, uh, still you'll get uh, some results that like uh, uh, more or less similar to what we have. So we'll get, uh, if you apply it on log normal distribution, you'll get uh, p values that are lower than uh, 0 0.05 in, maybe not in 5% of cases, but in 4% of cases or something like that. Okay, uh, any other questions? Okay, maybe people want to sleep. Uh, I have a question. So you, you, you've been saying this skewed, term skewed. Uh, skewed. Uh, I mean, how do you spell skewed. it? Yes. Skewed. This. Uh, ah, uh, uh, it means uh, asymmetrical.
So actually, skewness is a, a specific uh, uh, measure of asymmetry in your distribution. Yeah, that's actually all. <laughs> you don't need to know for now uh, about that. <laughs> OK, any other questions? OK, so that's all for today. Uh, I will see you next time. It was, it was nice to see you. It was nice to hear you. So good night.